Hello and welcome to Pods Above Replacement, part of the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. My name is Rafi Cantor. I am the producer of Padres Hot Tub and joining me from the Mile High City, he's about to blow past his innings limit. It's John Prakota. <laughs> Thank God talking does not matter when one's elbow hurts. Otherwise, I don't know if I could continue. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't want to worry about that that larynx blowing out, <laughs> and we've all seen when, when a when a couple of ticks go off the old voice box. <laughs> is that podcast. is that Craig? Is that Craig with his new job? Is he? I don't blows? know, dude. He's he's kind of a workhorse, dude. He's he's like one of those guys that's like still putting up over two hundred innings a year, uh, posting up. Uh, but John, happy New Year. Uh, I don't no, know. Thank if you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, it's the first time, like, we've spoken in the new year, so I don't know if it's still gauche to say Happy New Year, given that it's the middle of January, but, um, you know, I hope you had a good holiday. How's, uh, how's, how are you doing? I did. I'm married now, which is nice. I'm a married man, like, like Rafi, before me. We're taking what? ladies. Yeah, we're gonna, we're what? gonna kill our, our female following. I'm sorry, Rafi, with her. Hey, nice. I know. <laughs> The 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 one uh the, the one person in the her. YouTube we comments, know her. We yeah, know yeah, her. yeah yeah who's like in like who's like the Beatles fan and like the way that the Beatles like you know people would be screaming in the crowd but there's like there's one person for pots of replacement um okay we're gonna move on from this bit um uh well, we hope you're watching on YouTube if you if you are you would have just seen both John and I flash our wedding rings um which uh you know you can only get exclusively by looking at us on the internet uh so please we hope you're uh subscribed you're watching us there uh we're gonna throw up some videos of some uh erstwhile Padres pictures some statistics that we're gonna throw at you as well uh so check us out there um and today's episode uh you know pretty simple I think uh we're gonna be talking about the 2024 Padres bullpen and specifically about the potential flaws of the 2024 bullpen. Um, there are a few that are a little bit concerning, John. Um, <laughs> this is definitely a little bit of a different group that's going out there this year. Um, before we uh, go into the problems, um, I thought we could just start with a little vibes check. So I think like, yeah. just like vibes check, how are you feeling about the bullpen this year? Vibes check as though it is complete or vibes check at this point right now, knowing how much money we have to spend and guessing where that might amount in the future. I, I just want a vibes check. I don't I don't want I don't want any qualifiers on it. This is supposed <laughs> to be broad. This is like a Rorschach <laughs> test. You know what I mean? It's like, what do you see when I say vibes check? Like, what, just what, like, what, how are you feeling about the bullpen? Um, I feel okay and a lot of that is based on optimism upon which i think that we will like up the manner in which we will use our bullpen i think will lead to better numbers than we have had in the past i think that that's fair i would uh I would call my vibe um, okay to bad. Um, I think I pro if you had asked me a few hours ago, I would have said okay. I think okay. looking at our episode we're about to do, yeah, I, 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 know, actually, I, know, right? I actually feel a little bit worse <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, about the bullpen. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, you know, you asked some qualifiers and I refused to give them to you. So I'm going to give them to myself now. Um, what I will say is I, I am highly suspect that the group assembled currently is going to be the final group that takes yeah, the, yeah. the field in, in April, March, whatever, you know, whatever we do, uh, I guess, at least Korea is middle of March. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, that is tempering my pessimism. Uh, I will say, I think that the group currently assembled, uh, is a little bit less than inspiring and has yeah. some, um, 
pretty decent flaws that we should waste no time getting to now. So, um, John, why don't you take us through problem number one in your book? Okay. Problem number one actually has nothing to do with our bullpen. Okay, so let's just start this off. I... Going forward, in, for the next couple of months, what, what flavor are you going with? I have the orange. Oh, uh, tangerine. Orange LaCroix. I have uh, tangerine LaCroix. We are this is just super a, close. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm so, I still record this in my old, the office for my old job that I still kind of have. Um, and uh, I, we get like the Office Depot like shipment oh uh, yeah sure you know what i mean so it's like it's not the tangerine's kind of like a sexier Lacroix flavor <laughs> uh, the orange is like uh it's like a if you want to know, you know which of, of the par hosts are more fancy it's john with his tangerine Lacroix. <laughs> oh okay okay this is because this is this next however long we do this is actually going to kind of suck a little bit uh because this team <laughs> is <laughs> frustrating um what is your favorite LaCroix flavor, just as a palate Ooh. cleanser going into the episode. I'm very much spin drift. We, we would just we only do LaCroix based on uh, Costco cheapness, to be honest. And so I only get the Costco palette, which just straight up whatever Cran Raspberry is my favorite of those ones. But I don't have a I don't have a refined LaCroix palette personally. Um, well, there. Let me tell you, there are, are a lot of rare flavors you can get into. Um, the two of them, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll rank in, uh, ascending order. My second favorite is the beach plum, beach plum fa- okay. flavor. Um, my, my absolute favorite LaCroix is guava Sao Paulo, which oh, if you can find it, guava. Okay. do, do yourself a favor. Um, so, okay. Palette has been cleansed. <laughs> um, John, Take us through uh, problem number one, which is maybe not a Padre specific problem. Am I hearing that correctly? Yes. So, well, it is not, and it is. It's a little bit less important than Guava Sao Paulo, but the <laughs> importance, the importance. Okay. So, uh, what I was trying to say before, by before I got distracted by Lacroix, was a thing that I'm looking for going forward is manners in which we can improve our team. Over last year's production, despite having a lower quality team overall, which let's just take a par assessment. Do you think that our team, in terms of quality of players, assemble on the roster, at least at this point, even if you had $30 million of us paying for players, do you think that the quality of the team is higher than the quality of the team was at the beginning of last year? Sorry. Um... Can you just repeat the question for for one second? Yeah, so in- include $30 million of spent money. Do you think that the quality of the team at the beginning of the year will be as high as the quality of the team was at the beginning of last year? Am I, are we talking about just the bullpen or are we talking about... No, the team, the team, the team. No, the team will not be better than it was last year. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I also, no. I completely agree with that assessment. And what I'm trying to think of going forward is how with a lower quality team that 182 games how can we win more games going forward and one of the things so so now it ends up being like in what manners were we unsuccessful last year the most obvious one is very obviously runners in scoring position i don't think that we could possibly no matter any team that we assembled even if it's just alexi amarisa all the way through that we could be less successful in runners and runners in scoring position situations than we were last year. And that's going to be a certain amount of wins, whatever, but we're worse than that. So that takes away whatever the difference that is. So now you're looking for incremental improvements, right? I feel like those are the things that you're trying to think about if you're AJ Preller going forward. And one of those things is that last year we were, I would say dumb in the manner in which we used our team's capabilities a third time through a lineup. And let me go through some numbers. So the league average third time through a lineup as a starting pitcher last year was a 344 X Woba, which is, you know, hard to decipher in your mind. It's not great. It is, it amounts to a 510 X ERA. So about, a, a you know, over five ERA. That is what you can expect a third time through a lineup 
for a pitcher. Which, by the way, is why all the teams are trying to limit the manners in which, or the times upon which the team goes a third time through a lineup. That's like a, a thing that we've all been talking about for years and years and years. However, there are discriminant manners in which you can use your, your staff, right? So there, there are pitchers that are good a third time through the lineup. For us, specifically, Joe Musgrove and you, Darvish, have historically, and were last year, very good a third time through a lineup. However, there are a lot of pitchers who are terrible a third time through the lineup. So you want to use pitchers that are good a third time through a lineup, a third time through a lineup, right? And you do not want to use pitchers who are bad a third time through a lineup, a third time through a lineup. And so we were, we were able to do that. And Joe Musgrove and you Darvish were able to go through a lineup a third time. And they gave up an ex-WOBA of 296, which is equal to a 366 ex-ERA. And if you can give up a 366 ERA, which is what it was expected, a third time through a lineup, you're going to be successful, right? A 366 ERA, who's going to, like, that's perfectly fine. You would, you would never be mad about a 366 ERA. However, the rest of our team, those pitchers who are not Musgrove or Darvish, gave up a 544 expected ERA a third time through a lineup, right? So pitchers who are not good at going a third time through don't go a third time through, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, you're saying do the bad thing less and do the good thing more. Am I getting that straight? <laughs> yes, that's that is a very reasonable <laughs> manner in which to <laughs> to say what I was saying. Yes. However, we we are not good at doing the bad thing less. We we just aren't. So uh, w- what I did in this episode was I compared us to how the Rays use their bullpen. And the reason why it was interesting was because the Rays had one pitcher last year who went over 120 innings. One single one. pitcher. One. One single pitcher went above 120 innings. So how could the Rays be successful when they had one single pitcher going over 120 innings? We, like Nick Martinez on our team had 110 innings. Like he would have been one of the most used pitchers on the Rays. He would have been their second most used pitcher. He had 110 innings, their most had only over 120. So how do you how do you how do you ram like ramify those differences? Like how do you how do you get over those differences? And and the answer is that you have to use pitchers, even if they're only average pitchers, in situations which will be most beneficial for those pitchers, right? That once again, your summation can be the exact same, but to this point, do you agree with me? I agree with you. And I also think like when you say we should use average pitchers instead of sending guys through the order the third time, like I actually think like when people think of an average pitcher in their head, like I I would say based on what you're describing, it's better to use like less than average pitchers than send a pitcher in third time through the order. Thank you for teeing me up because now I'm going to talk about how we use Michael Walker and how we use Seth Lugo. So All of us would agree that Michael Walker and Seth Lugo were very successful last year. They were just very good pitchers. They had they gave way more innings than we would have expected, and they had a much like lower ERA than we would have expected. So, when going through the lineup the first two times, Michael Walker and Seth Lugo had two hundred nineteen innings and a two sixty three ERA. Right, that's like, could you have imagined a better? Outcome from Seth Lugo and Michael Walker than 219 innings and a 263 ERA? No, and it's worth saying also that, if I'm not mistaken, Lugo threw more innings than Walker. Is that right? Yeah, so... Which I wouldn't, would not have been on my bingo card. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and then Michael Walker was like basically surviving on one pitch, right? A really good changeup, and he had more right. overall innings. There's no way I think that you would guess what the ERA would be in those 60.1 innings that they had when they were going a third time through. Like, I'll, I'll be showing videos on this. Like, I, I've already put on the video, so hopefully the folks that are watching on YouTube will see the videos upon, like, you know, Seth Lugo and Michael Walker pitching the third time through where they get hammered. There's so many close games 
that they get hammered. What ERA do you think that they had in 60.1 innings, you know, 60 and a third innings, uh, third time through the lineup? What ERA would you guess they had? Okay, you said they had 219 innings and like a 263 ERA. Is that right overall? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, no, no, not overall. Not overall. Just the first two times through. Oh, for the first two times through. I see. What yeah. You're so there's okay. an extra 60 and a third innings, and okay. they had a yeah. different ERA. That makes that makes that is more higher, sense in my head obviously. because neither of them had sub three ERAs. Uh, so okay. Um, I would guess that their ERA would be like, given what we've discussed at this point, uh, very high, right? I- I'm gonna go for a five, just as a solid round number. It was seven. Three, no one. way. <laughs> so, so what, what I decided to do in terms of just like, okay, how can we make small incremental improvements was to put what a four ERA, just a, like what, what is more average than a four ERA? Like an, uh, just like throw a Ray Kerr out there for 60 innings in those like third time through innings. If, if that pitcher would have got a four ERA in those 60 and a third innings, they would have saved 22.2 runs which is equal to over two wins something in the round in the in the realm of like 2.5 wins to our team which was you know close to a playoff team so what we were not good at last year was very clearly middle innings and how to manage them the the thing that I was arguing like in my head against H.J. Preller in the back of my head, which is like, what what can we do that is better? And one of those things is be more raised like in the middle innings, right? And so, sure, we're gonna we're not gonna have we're not gonna re- reduce whoever our third, fourth, fifth starting pitcher is down to zero third times through innings, but. If they're at 60 innings of a 7.31 ERA, that's not acceptable, right? You, any right. any Nabil Chrisma, any Ray Kerr, any, I don't know, any pitcher that you can think of in Padres history is going to be better than a 7.31 ERA. And so that's a manner in which we can improve our team. I, I, I'm just thinking, because w- when you were saying, tossing some of these names out there, I was like trying to look uh, about like who would be these people that would be coming in and uh, throwing, you know, the the innings you'd be substituting for third time through the order. Uh, and just to throw out a name last year, guys, remember Drew Carlton? Drew Carlton <laughs> yeah, yeah. came no, up. Yeah. Drew Carlton, definition of a quad A pitcher. Uh, sure. No shot. No shots at Drew. Like, I hope you're listening. But, like, just based off of your the performance last year, like, 20 and two-thirds innings, 4.35 ERA ball on that and he and by the way uh 3.79 fip so maybe even a little bit unlucky depending on what you want to say so (laughs) um yeah you you throw that guy in in the fifth inning or the fifth and sixth inning if you if you are nasty and you you you, you're feeling yourself like that's a lot better of an outcome um someone else who i'm going to throw out there right now whose role with the padres undefined as of yet pedro avila He's someone who sure. I could absolutely see coming in in the fourth, fifth, sixth innings and do basically what he was doing at the end of the year last year where he was showing up through uh, 50 and a third innings for the Padres and at 3.22 ERA clip. Um, you know, maybe a little bit lucky in that sample, but, you know, still the point being that, yeah, if my choice is throwing a starter the third time through the order uh or you know putting in you know at, at a six or seven era potentially or putting in you know a quad a guy <laughs> who's going to do some mop up like i really see your point i really see your point john this is really interesting so it, i like if you go through the videos true like i i was not doing this to i was doing this to try to like show the videos upon which like these pitches were going a third time through but like very often it was a very close game in which they got like destroyed in the fifth inning or the sixth inning and there, there is a counter argument, which is like, OK, if a pitcher does not go through a third time, then you need a certain amount of innings. And I just want to let you know out there that I have a solution for that. And we're going to talk about that later. But let me just talk about how the Rays like performed and what, what they did instead. So, like I said before, Musgrove and Darvish were 
good at going a third time through. They have always been good at going a third time through. Snell would be a, a player who has historically not been good a good a uh, good a third time through. For multiple reasons, one because he's going through the third time when he already has like eighty plus pitches, so he's already tiring out, and also because he is a pitcher unlike Darvish or Musgrove, whose stuff falls off quicker. So he's mm-hmm. like closer to a relief arm than those guys probably are, just in terms of all the quality of his pitches. So his pitch shapes just drop off quicker. So, historically, Darvish and Musgrove, they have a ton of pitches, and they are able to last long into a game. Snell, not quite as much. He ended up having a year in which his ex-ERA was, like, super high, but, like, a third time through. But his ERA was fine, so he ended up, you know, being a Cy Young because of it. However, like, you, you wouldn't want to... Like, the Rays certainly wouldn't want to use him a third time through very much. There's a historical precedent for that, maybe even in the World Series. Talk about that. But the Rays, a third time through, had only a 4.01 XERA. And the reason why is because they only used the pitchers that they already knew were good at going through a third time. Like, for the most part, a third time through the lineup. So they used Zach Eflin, they used Glasnow, and they used McClanahan. They used them. 56% 56% of the time that they went a third time through an order. Whereas we use Musgrove and Darvish only 30% of the time that we went a third time through an order. So basically, the Rays, they use pitchers who they knew could go through a third time, a third time through the order, a lot more often. And we use pitchers who, like, did not perform well, like Lugo, like Waka, who previously mentioned, but also like Waldron, like Avila, like Weathers who just got freaking smoked every time they went through a third time. And <laughs> and it destroyed our numbers overall, right? Despite Darvish and, and Musgrove having, like, great numbers overall, who, like, helped us be above average, everybody who wasn't those two names got destroyed, like, at a, a you know, 544 XERA, at a, you know, rate. So, still slowly building my argument. The Rays used pitchers who are good at going a third time through often and used pitchers who are bad at it less. Still makes sense? Still makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 you, you said it in a way um, that I think is really digestible, but, but I, I just want to reiterate for folks like that difference between the Rays and the Padres in terms of the percentage of their third time through the innings orders. Like, like, 70% of the time, basically, we were throwing guys out there the third time through the order who would have been worse than putting in Drew Carlton per se. Yes. You know what I mean? That's a, 70% that's exactly. of the time versus the Rays who were doing it less than half. And, you know, you know, who's to say, you know, what that that less than half that they're talking about, how, how much worse they are than than are, you know, third time through the order guys who clearly were quite bad. Um, so yeah. Okay. This is, this is making a lot of sense to me. I'm on board. Uh, you know, said, you know, I'm ready. You could bring me to a timeshare presentation and I would uh, (laughs) sign up to whatever, whatever you're pitching right now, John. (laughs) That is what I'm trying to do. Yeah. But, (laughs) but, but I mean, the fact is they also threw, so it's not just a like percentage of players who are quality at this job. It's also a magnitude of players that are quality at this job. Like every like if the if the major league average is a 5.10 xERA, you probably want to reduce that number, right? They had 141 fewer innings a third time through an order. So like that what you could expect at best to be something around 5 ERA, they had 100 fewer 140 fewer innings of that. So they basically had a whole like a starting pitcher's worth of innings at five ERA that they just like, nope, we're not going to do that because that is obviously stupid, right? Like you wouldn't, if you had a five ERA pitcher, you would hopefully try to get somebody who's better than a five ERA pitcher and you wouldn't pitch him for 140 innings. And that is what the Rays did. They said, we will pitch 140 fewer innings of this terrible thing and we will do it better than the Padres did in those innings. Still makes sense? It still makes sense. The only thing I'll disagree with is that I don't know that it's that obvious that 
you would cut that five ERA guy out because the Padres didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> there, are other, there are other teams True. who didn't do it. So it's like, I hear you. I, I, I take your point. And it seems like when you lay it out that way, it's like, well, duh, we should, you know, again, do the good thing more and do the bad thing less. But it's clearly not obvious. Or there are like a lot of other reasons for for why, uh, you know, a, a, a manager, a general manager, an organization would be willing to do something actively worse for your team. Like, I'm sure there are a number of reasons at play, but, you know, again, we're, we're not really interested in the, in the non-statistical stuff. Like, boy, this podcast yeah. is interested in the statistical perspective, and the statistics are telling us we're doing the wrong thing. Yes. And, yeah. And, I mean, that's, that's the point, right? That's, that's the trying to cut the, you know, wheat from the chaff, whatever chaff is. Um... <laughs> You know, <laughs> trying try to get the best from the team that you have. Do you know what Chaff is? I don't know what Chaff is. Um, I, I could guess I would probably be wrong. I, I'm so down just to turn this into the what is Chaff episode. Like, fuck the bullpen. Fuck baseball. Like, you know, this team. It's the part whatever. that's not the weight, obviously. And right? the, yes, it's exactly. It's that's the like, stem? Yeah. 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 It, like, it yeah. is not the wheat, therefore it is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fuck the stem. That's what I've been saying for years. Check me. So <laughs> So okay. So <laughs> what what this ended up being was like numbers that are dramatically different than ours. So like it, it if you go over so I, I already said that they only had one pitcher that had over 120 innings, which is obviously wildly different than us. And they only had eight times all of last year, eight times all of last year in which they had a starting pitcher go over 100 pitches. Eight times. What would you guess our number was? Theirs was eight. Okay, if theirs was eight, I would guess something like five times that. So let's say 40. Let's say 40. You are so... You're a smart boy, you know that? It's, your mom always tells me, she says, <laughs> Rafi is a smart boy. And I say, you're right. They had 42. Very close. Okay, okay. So, yeah, uh, basically five times more. Basically five times more they were willing to deal, like, or five times fewer they were willing to deal with, like, there's no pitcher that's that good after 100 pitches. That's just not yeah. my thing. So they were willing to, you know, cut to the Ray Kerrs of the world and the middle Chris Mats, the, you know, whatever they, they also had 61 games in which they had fewer than 80 pitches in the whole game. So that means that they basically either had an opener and a, whatever the bulk picture was through fewer than 80 games. How many do you think we had? They had 61 under 80 pitches. Is there most, the, whoever was a pitcher that threw the most that game? Uh, sorry, you cut out for a second. Just, uh, I'm guessing how many we had. Yeah, that were under 80 pitches. The whoever's the most used pitcher for that game. We had 60, or they had 61 games that they used pitchers for fewer than 80 pitches. Well, I'm just gonna stick with my formula. So five times in the other direction. So I'm gonna say 12. They had tw we had 26 games in which pitchers pitched okay. in fewer than 80. The reason probably, I, I mean, that is a good reason, but you also have to account for like pitcher pitchers getting smoked, right? So like right. there's some there's some pitchers who like they get smoked and you take them out under 80. So yeah, we ended enough. up having 26. And an argument for, for me going forward, another argument, just lay these arguments out parallel, is that we have talked a lot about Schilt being a hire that I think is considered going full Preller, right? You've said this in the past on PHT. Like, do you agree that probably this year is going to be a full Preller year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's very much, I mean, Schilt being on a two-year deal, which is essentially a one-year deal, like, to me, that just says, like, Schilt and Preller are on the line. Um, again, we know nothing. The organization is a black box. We could be completely wrong, but sure. that is a very strong, like, again, it's like, to me, what that says is Schilt is on a one year deal. And then if you fire Schilt, are you really going to let AJ Preller choose another manager? Yeah, yeah. Like, we, yeah. we, we, we've had that conversation like two times already. Like, are we going to do it a third time? Like, so, what would you do? Like, think about that. Like, what would you do? Like, would you get like a really, 
a high status man like what was it? what is even the like it feels like you can't like it's like you can't even like trick people into being like oh yeah we knew you know we need to get a little bit more full preller or like, like yeah <laughs> yeah exactly uh so yes i i would agree with you there will be full preller. okay so uh, another argument that i would have is that we've already been full preller this is not the first time that we're going full preller i think that there's no way that you could argue that hiring jace tingler a manager who manages in his head was not full tingler there's and he got angry at Preller at the end of his, like, managerial stint. Why? Probably because Preller was telling him exactly what to do every second of the day. I already think that we've gone full Preller. I think that we can use sample sizes from, like, 2019, 2020, and 2021 to make guesses on what full Preller is. So, based on that premise, which may or may not be right, but how many... So in 2021, we were just talking about this. So in in last year, the Rays had 61 times in which they used a pitcher under 80 pitches. We had 26. How many times do you think that we used a pitcher under 80 pitches in 2021? The last time that I would say we were full Preller. Um, Okay, well, we know that uh, Tingler had a very fast hook. That was kind of a... Yes. Topic. Uh, I would guess not as much as the Rays, but probably pretty close. So I'm going to just guess another round number and I'm going to say 45. It was 64, which is a number even higher than the the Rays used. Yeah. So it was it, it was a fast hook often and more than the Rays which is probably the team that you would think of as being the most likely. I mean, they're, they are the Snell story, right? They are the Snell coming out in the World Series, you know, way earlier than everybody thought that he should come out. They are that team. They pulled pitchers at a less rate than we did in 2021. So I would argue that probably for all those fans out there of Bo Mel's rather slow hook, Probably Schilt, who suddenly, you know, his one lesson from being in the Cardinals is that he should probably listen to a GM more or whatever he said. Like, uh, <laughs> I, should, I should probably just listen to the person that's paying me so that I can get paid a lot more often. <laughs> that guy, <laughs> you know, probably he's also going to have a fast hook. And also, I would argue, maybe that's a good idea. So. Getting to the next part, which is the solution to this problem, which, you know, I I stated up up top that it could have cost us up to two and a half wins last year, which is a lot of wins on a team that was, you know, playoff adjacent. And I think that we could are I I think that the par stance, at least for this coming season, is that we're probably going to be wild card competitive. It's not like a guarantee that we'll get in. And it's also not a guarantee that we won't get in. It'll be, you know, it's going to be a long season and we'll see how it plays out. But probably if you were to put the or that, you know, dice roll down, you'd probably say like, you know, what, 60% chance that we make it to playoffs, maybe somewhere in the 60 to 40%. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I 60% because I would say it's slightly better than coin flip territory. Uh, yeah. I think that that's probably fair. Um, I'd say two and a half wins is not just a lot, but also, like you said, we were playoff adjacent. Like, we were two wins behind the Diamondbacks. Like, and if you're rounding up, that gets us over the hump. Diamondbacks won the pennant. Doesn't mean that we win the pennant, but I'm just saying that, like, it, 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 it is all that's important anymore nowadays is just getting into the dance. And so, yes, I think that those yeah. two and a half wins are very, very important. Yeah, I mean, yeah, me too. And so, <sighs> par. We are, you know, it's been it's been a good uh, almost a whole year now, and we are a player forward podcast. I would say that, especially yeah. in terms of like contracts, where like you know, yeah, maximize how much money you can make. Sure, if you want to, I mean, hater really tested those limits. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, in terms of like, but like for the most part, yeah, do do what it is. That you can to make the most money. This next, this next portion, which is my solution, you can argue against it, but John Precota putting his dice down on his money down on like what the solution could be, how to maybe get one 
maybe two of those wins back, maybe not the full 2.5, is something that I would like to call the middle inning conveyor belt. Okay, this is not the most player forward thing that I would argue, but let me just paint a picture. Okay, let's imagine a game. There are many. Me looking up the like videos from third time through for Waka and Lugo really expresses, especially for Lugo for whatever reason. Like he was going a third time through in close games way too often. But okay, let me let me paint a picture. Me on our Discord, Michael Waka is through four and two thirds innings and he's given up one run. And say we're up two to one, something like that. Now, Michael Waka through four and two thirds innings. We're up two to one. He ends up going six innings. We give, he ends up giving up three runs because he's terrible third time through. And we're down three to two at the, at, at, through six innings. And what does the Discord look like? It usually looks something like this. If you would have told me Michael Walker would have got, given us six innings of three runs, I would have taken it. Right? That's what most people would have said. Now, let's imagine an alternate universe in which Michael Walker gets pulled after four and two thirds innings. And Nabil Chris Mack comes in. Nabil Chris Mack comes in and he throws one and a third innings, still gets us through six innings. He gives up one run, right? He blows the lead. So now it's two to two. He has a like, what, six ERA or whatever through those one and a thirds innings. He blew the lead. And everybody in that scenario would probably say, what the hell, manager? You pulled Waka when he'd have gone four and two thirds innings. And he put in Chris Matt, who immediately blew the lead. However, through six innings, we are in a better situation than we would have been had we left right. Waka in. Right. And that's, that, that is a fallacy that I think that we all think. There's this weird thing that we're all like, hey, if you would have told me this, then it would have been fine. And that's true, I guess. But like, if you would have told me that pitchers are terrible a third time through, and we used a pitcher a third time through, for me, I'd be like, hey, that was stupid. Because to me, with a little bit more nuance, that's a poor decision. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that that's one of those uh, tricks that our brain plays on us because we don't view these things in a statistical vacuum. We don't view them as an OOTP game. We view them as, <laughs> sure. uh, yeah, as part of a, an active story. And one of the stories that we tell ourselves in baseball is that, you know, that, that stud starters who grit out, you know, a quality yeah. start are are valuable to the t- like that's a more valuable thing to the team um uh, which to some extent it's true if they can do it consistently you know and like you yeah. you know average that out but 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 i take your point like it's like everything is context dependent and like also i think the other thing too is uh w- we're saying like oh they blew the lead you know we were up to one to uh one and now we're now it's tied to two um but at the same time, we're not saying like, "Hey, why is the offense only scored two runs?" You know what I mean? Sure. Like, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. If, if your if your uh, pitcher gives up two runs, your, your your staff gives up two runs in six innings. Like, yeah, you're you're happy, and you're also happier than if they gave up two runs or th- <laughs> than three runs in six innings. So I, I I take your point. It's like it's it's important to look at. It, it's not quite gambler's fallacy. I don't know what the right word is for it, but it's just like every time that you are given the chance to make a decision. To, to be making the right one. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and I love that you brought up a point, which I was also thinking of, which is like, you need the innings. You just do. Like, you, you need a certain amount of innings. And so, sure, you're, you're getting those middle innings from a starting pitcher. And if you take out a starting pitcher at four and two thirds innings every time, you're going to run out of pitchers eventually. You just will. That yeah. is something that I, that, yeah. So this is where, <laughs> this is the point in which Parr officially gets a little bit anti-player. And that's the point in which I would say the necessary conclusion is a raise like version of what I would consider to be sacrificial lambs. Okay, so... Sacrificial lambs. What the heck is a sacrificial lamb? You need pitchers. I already put up a number that was like five ERA. You need a pitcher who is better than a five ERA. A time, you know, a 
an inning through the lineup at all times available to you, at all times available to you. And if you, you need probably something like 30 total innings of those a month where they are going to put up a, you know, better than five ERA through those middle innings. And how are you supposed to get those 30 innings? I would argue that the only way you can do that is to use pitchers who you can either option after using heavily, get rid of them because they're a rule five pick, or get rid of them because they are like waiver candidates. Or, you know, you know, you can either option them, DFA them, or give them back to the team that they were on. We have a lot of those candidates. And so what I would argue is that we need a certain amount of pitchers, in the middle innings especially, who can burn 15 innings. You can't do 15 innings six times. You know, you can't do 15 innings, you know, for six straight months, which is like you said before we got online, that that's about nine, so yeah, it's about 90 innings. You're not going to get a, nine innings is a lot to get from a middle reliever. However, 15 innings for a month, that seems normal. And then option them and either give them rest and call them up again or never call them up again, whatever. You can do that. We have so many names that we can burn that I would argue are better than five ERA names. Okay, I, I hear your point, John, but like you say that we have a lot of these guys. Like who like who are we talking about? Who are who are candidates for this sort of little experiment? Okay. So out of options for us on our 40-man roster, I mean we have an unfilled 40-man roster and we have so many guys. It it seems to me that this is exactly what AJ Preller's job is because we have so many guys, despite having such a small 40-man roster. We have Adrian Morejon, Jay Groom, and Luis Patino. All on a roster who are all out of options. We also have Stephen Kolick, who is a rule five pick. So basically, any of those four guys, you're immediately willing to either bump off your squad, like right away, or you know, keep if they're successful. And then in terms of optionable players, we have Alec Jacob, we have Jeremiah Estrada, we have Glenn Otto, we have Glo- Logan Gillespie, we have Pedro Avila, we have Matt Waldron, we have Johnny Brito, we have Randy Vasquez, and then we have Sean Reynolds, if Sean Reynolds is anybody, right? So a thing that we have never had in the past is optionable players. We've always struggled in that manner. We've had dudes that can, you know, pitch every other day, like Nabil Chrisma and uh, Craig Salmon, but like usually they didn't have options, or if they did have options, we'd just be screwed because nobody else could come up and, and like be mediocre or even below mediocre and fill those innings this year we do we we actually have media we uh this is a ringing endorsement for aj probably we have a ton of mediocre pitchers (laughs) (laughs) Um, so my my point is that my, my point is just that we need like you know you have a 13 man pitching roster we need like 10 dudes maybe 11 dudes who are actually good and then we need two to three sacrificial lambs, dudes who are able to throw their arms out by throwing 15 innings a, a month better than a five ERA. So um, I would say that we follow the team a lot, that we are like people who sure. really do pay attention to the Padres. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. When you threw out the name Glenn Otto, I was just like, I'm just going to trust <laughs> that. I'm going to trust that this guy's actually on our, uh, our organization. Uh, and then I, I Googled him and I was like, oh, yes. Okay. Glenn Otto. I remember him. He came from, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was like, I was like, Glenn Otto is like such a good, like quad a pitcher Thanks. name. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, Glenn, I hope you're a stud for us this year. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I totally, I take your point. Um, there's a, an inherently kind of cynical bent to this a little bit of just being like, hey, we just got to like take guys and kind of chew them up and spit them out. And like, that's what it is. But also there's a reason that the teams do this. There's a reason why the Rays yes. do this. Like, and the Rays are good every year. And like, I know that like, you know, only like 12,000 people show up in St. Petersburg, but like, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. The Rays are winning 90 games every year, at least. I mean, if not more. Um, so yeah, I, I, I take, I take your point on this and I, I just want to go back for a second because, um, 
I, when we were talking earlier about, you know, putting in these kind of guys or going third time through the order. And I said like, oh, it's kind of like gambler's fallacy, but that's not quite right. I remember what I was trying to say. It's actually the Monty Hall problem. Are you you're familiar with the Monty Hall problem? Um, no, at least I don't remember it. Start me off on it's, it. Yeah, so the Monty Hall problem is like a classic statistical thing. Craig has talked about it on the show before. It's based on the show Let's Make a Deal, but it's essentially like there's three doors oh, ahead yeah, of you. Oh, yeah, I remember. I, yeah, I know what it yeah. is. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll just for our audience, you know, the, let's make a deal. You, there's door number one, door number two, door number three. To, behind one of these uh, is, a, is a car, a brand new car. Behind the other two, you know, in some versions, it's a goat. In some versions, it's nothing. Um, but uh, basically, you know, Doors one, two, three, you pick one. So let's say it's you, you pick door number one. Um, yeah. Monty Hall opens door number three and there's nothing behind it. So you're still in the running. And Monty Hall offers you the chance to switch doors. Switch, switch, switch. Go, okay, John, why do you switch doors? <laughs> you switch because now you know that there's a, your proposition is between two options, which makes your, op, your, pro, your likelihood 50%. Whereas when you originally picked, it was 33%. So even better than that, John, when you were picking uh, your, your doors, you had a 33% chance. And basically, there's a 33% chance that your thing is behind door number one. And now you know there's a 67% chance that it's actually behind door number two because you've eliminated one of the 33% options. Does that make sense? Like... That that's that's why like you actually want to switch doors. There's there's actually a two thirds probability of winning the car if you switch than if you stick with the door number one. And what I was trying to say in the context of why we let starters go a third time through is because there's a narrative that if you hang on to door number one, which is what going third time through your yeah, starter it's is, it's been successful. That, it's been that, successful. Yeah. Well, also that you're playing the game the right way. Real people, what yeah, they play, let's yeah. make a deal. They don't switch doors. Yeah, they, they, don't they switch. stick with. They stick with their door. They stick with their guy. You know what I mean? And like that's like that's what it is. Yeah. And really, every time you should be switching doors and going with Nabil Chrismat. And yes, that's not sexy. And like that, you sometimes know, it's Ray Kerr. Like. like yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but and yeah, sometimes guess what? The doors behind or the cars behind door number one. Sometimes your starter goes out and he shoves the third time through. But yeah, sure. But but more frequently he's gonna get shelled, <laughs> and it's better to put in a Joe Schmo guy. Um, yeah. Okay. So and then we just talked about who all the Joe Schmo guys are uh, on this team, which is uh, impressive uh, that we have so many. Um, what about later <laughs> is it, down? Is it? Yeah. What about later down the <laughs> innings order, John? Like how uh, when we're getting towards seventh, eighth, ninth innings, you know, what what is this bullpen looking like? Yeah. So I would argue that my solution for this problem, which is what I call the middle eight innings conveyor belt, are exclusively people that you're willing to burn. Right. There are people who you're willing to throw 15 innings in a month, which is potentially dangerous for their health, first of all. And also, like, at best, you're probably optioning, waving them, phantom ILing them at the end. Right. So, like, they're not part of your, you know, the crux of your team. You're not. These are not the people who you want to be pitching playoff innings, for example. However, if you do have this strategy, this turn and burn, this, you know, like by felicia strategy also okay do, do you know what by felicia is from do you know what uh it's wait it's it's it from martin no is it from, from the movie friday, friday? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah I, no I just okay. wondered martin because, like, is damn gina martin is damn gina yeah yeah okay okay i get it okay Did, have you seen the movie friday no <laughs> okay i have not i was just i, I was just wondering because there's this there's this like group of people that i was with they were all like my uh like my med school class and they were all like we had like have you ever played the jackbox game which is like your t-shirt game where you like have to design a t-shirt I've anyway, it's a fun game. You, yeah yeah so it, it's, it's basically somebody draws a picture on a t-shirt and another person puts a label and somebody put by felicia and Nobody knew what movie that was from, but like everybody used that term in their life. And that's when I learned that I was old was that was when everybody in my med school class was like, yeah, I know by Felicia, but that, what movie is that from? And then like me thinking about explaining it to him, I was like, all right, so 
back in the day, we'd go to freaking Blockbuster. We'd rent a movie yeah. called Friday. We'd get a VHS. We'd put it in, and then we'd laugh about how funny it is to, like, you know, degrade women. And anyways, <laughs> none of, <laughs> at the time, it was funny, I swear to you. But anyways, <laughs> so... Now I'm old because by Felicia is like this antiquated term that we use, like champing at the bit. So what I'm trying to say overall is that you need players that are like solid end of innings pitchers that you can use every day. And it seems like our strategy lately has been to use pitchers every other day, which means that in order to satisfy the seventh through ninth inning roles, you need six solid pitchers. And we've already, to me, telegraphed our strategy Maybe we'll get one more. I hope we really do because this would help for our strategy. But so far, it seems like we have six pitchers that we're willing to rely on. And those folks are Suarez, Matsui, Go, De Los Santos, Cosgrove, and Wilson. Do you agree? Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. I don't know what else they'd be using it, those people for. <laughs> yeah. So th- those are like, you know, if the game's closer, you're going to see one of those guys. And then, so now, now we'll transition to our thoughts on the new signings. I want to start by saying that I think that I love the Matsui signing. I think that it was a very good, you know, use of our finances. We don't have a lot of money. We didn't use a lot of money. 5.6 AAV. And there's a pretty good chance that he's good. Also, I think that, how are we pronouncing it? Usukko? Is that how it is? Yeah, Usukko. Yeah. Usukko. I think that his chances of being successful are incredibly low. I, I don't like him being in high leverage situations at all. Here's why. Okay, so he had a 3 6 e- 8 ERA in the KBO last year against teams that are never seeing high velo. We saw how much like Hassan Kim struggled against high velo when he first came over to the major leagues, and this guy throws 95+. plus. So he has the the velocity, but he also walks 11.6% of folks, which, by the way, Snell has 10.9% for his career. And what's the thing about Snell is that he walks way too many pitch- or way too many batters. So this guy throws velo, walks a ton of people, and was not dominant in the KBO, which is a like, you know, double A, maybe a little bit higher level. There's no way that you could argue to me. Who that Ray Kerr, who threw a 2.25 ERA last year, pitching on the moon in AAA, would not dominate KBO. And there's also no way that a pitcher who throws 95 plus, when everybody can see their pitch shapes, would not have yielded more than two years and $5 million at the age of 25 on the open market. Like the Braves basically bought Ray Kerr for $5 million. And they were just seeing him as a project, you know? There's no... We we knew the pitch shapes of Usuko and knew that he was walking everybody and we got him at two years, five million. Was that a great purchase or was it everybody else being like, this is a project and you guys are paying for a project? Yeah, I don't know. I, I do want to defend Usuko just a little bit. He he did have a three six eight ERA last year. His career ERA in KBO is three point one eight, which is not again like world eating, but it's still I would take that a lot. The half a run does make a big difference in my mind. Sure, um, but yeah, even I with mean, the walk again, rates, uh, his walk rate because his walk rates were always rate, above ten. Uh, in terms of his career right now, I can tell you he had a hundred. He has one hundred sixty three career walks uh, against. I don't know. I'd have to. Oh, here we go. The walk rate's 4.0. Still a lot. That's very high. Um, that's. I think Blake Snell was like a five last year, and that was like maybe gonna set a major league record. So if you're four per four walks per nine, then that's that's very 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 high. Um, for a reliever who's you know coming in and like potentially with guys on base already. Um, that's not something that you want to see. Um, yeah, I I am a little bit uh suspect of him being used in anything other than like the seventh inning at most i would say like ideally the sixth inning like he seems like he would be like a good yeah solid dude to bring in but um yeah i mean but we're also only paying him two million dollars a year 
Uh, so I'm not I'm I'm not really like hardcore tripping about like whether or not Usuko works out just purely from like a salary standpoint. Um, but I take your point that he's like a worse Ray Kerr, and he's righty. Yeah, and we would rather have a lefty. We you'll get into that later, but I, yeah. yeah, I think that he's probably a worse raker. Anyways, from how low I am on Usuko, I'm super high on Matsui actually. So the and the reason why is largely because of K rates and just his overall success at a higher level. So NPB, just you know what folks say is quad A, whatever you want to do with that, but. Importantly, he has had a 36.4% K rate over the past three seasons, which, just to put that in perspective, Hayter had a 36.8% K rate last year, you know, very in line with Matsui over the past three years, and Hayter's in the 99th percentile, you know, so even if you take away, you know, a large percent, he's still going to be probably in the upper, you know, quartile of, you know, K rates in the in the MLB and we have him for his 28 through 32 year old seasons and we're only paying him 5.6 million per year. So the the main the main thing that everybody's concerned about based on like whether he is able to succeed with the baseball being a little bit bigger considering he's only 5'8 and 167 pounds. I don't know. To me, he'll probably adjust over time, and I would I would also bet that if you're going to commit that kind of money, you probably have seen him be able to like rec- recreate certain pitch shapes. But even even if he weren't, he probably eventually will recreate those things. And the thing is, we don't need him to be Josh Hader. We need him to be at five point six million per year. Pierce Johnson. Like, do you think that he could be Pierce Johnson over the next couple years? I think he could be Pierce Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the other thing I, I will say about Matsui, which I think is important, is that um, he posts, like in terms of like he he pitches a lot. In in ten seasons, he's thrown uh, seven hundred and four innings in the in uh, NPB. So that's seventy innings a season. Now, I mean, I do think the first season he was in the uh, NPB, they were trying him out as a starter before he moved to the bullpen because he threw one hundred thirty six innings that season. But even if you you just take that off the top, um, you know that leaves you uh, with something around 570 in nine seasons. So that's still over 60 innings a season, which we'll take from a reliever. Um, so yeah, if he's putting up those kind of numbers with the Padres, just in terms of workload, like I'm very optimistic on him. I think he has a. Um, well, I have no idea what his ceiling is. I do think his floor is pretty high i do think he'll be like a pretty solid guy i mean there was like those kind of weird reports that i'll get to in a second about like him not really being able to throw the world baseball classic ball because it's like a different ball um that's just i think something that when you get more familiar with it that you know i on the concernometer from one to ten it's like a two for me it's not like a huge difference just because like i just think guys adjust when they are forced to you know, why would he ever throw a major league baseball if he's been pitching an MPB his whole life? Like it doesn't, you know, and then all of a sudden for two yeah, weeks, sure. he has yeah, to throw it. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah it's going to be weird. Um, So give him one spring training and, and, and I think that, you know, he'll be okay. Um, Okay. Um, This is all super interesting, John. I, I know I have some stuff I want to get to in a second, but um, I see one more section on here about midseason call-ups. Um, what what do you want to talk about there in regards to the bullpen? I mean, th- this point is is basically just like the fact that it's something we've been harping on for a long time. Is like when the credit card is due, and the credit card seems to have been due this past off season. In terms of like calling up prospects, we missed basically a wave, and now we're hoping for the next wave to succeed. I do think that we have Drew Thorpe. We have our little bet on when Drew Thorpe makes his debut. Adam Mazur. Robbie Snelling, Jairi Iriarte, then there's like Burgert and Hawkins who are more like maybe they'll show up at some point. I I think that you are kind of from our like thought process standpoint trying to get us to midseason. We're trying to like you know cover this midseason and hope against hope that 
someone like Drew Thorpe or Adam Mazur are able to provide some kind of innings going forward. That being said, those folks are not, like, everybody that I just named, Thorpe, Mazur, Snelling, Iriarte, Berger, Hawkins, none of them them are what I would call sacrificial lambs, dudes that you are willing to throw 15 innings in a month and just, you know, hopefully they don't blow their elbow out because these are the people that we are hoping for in the future. But I do think that that's kind of our perspective. We're really just trying to, like, win half a year right now. And then, you know, if we can get to the trade deadline and have a successful team that is a win and maybe we'll make you know deadline deals at that point maybe preller will have been able to pump and dump new prospects that we don't even think about right now probably that will be the case right there's going to be whatever is the rising prospect next year there's always is that guy um but that's kind of what we're thinking right i think that it's best to think of in half season segments and right now we're trying to get to the half season with these guys that I, I think that we can turn and burn. Guys that are Nabil Chrismat level quality and just use them until we get to those Thorps, the Mazers, that, and the Snellings, that, the Iriartes that can maybe give two plus innings um, consistently. Yeah, I I hear you on that. Um, I I do just because I'm I'm looking at the clock and we're we're running it up a little bit. I kind of want to get to um, the 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 last I think big problem um, that this bullpen really has, and sure. it's the lack of left-handed pitching. And um, I just want to say something that might sound like a little bit of a hot take, um, but. Having no lefty starters actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter like at all. Um, I don't know if you've already <laughs> looked in our document, but uh, if you okay, um, I'm gonna tell you what the league wide uh starting pitcher ERA splits were based on handedness. Okay, and I'm gonna give you the right handed pitcher, and I want you to guess what the left the left handed pitcher one is. So in Last year, 2023, in Major League Baseball, right-handed starters had a 4.44 ERA. What would you guess lefties had? 4.4. Well, I would, so left-handed starting pitchers, in general, you have to be a little bit, like, you have to be overly successful. So I'd say it's something a little bit lower than that, like maybe 4.2. Um, they were actually worse than righties, slightly. Uh, oh, were they? Left, okay. Lefties had a 4.48 ERA against righties 4.44. Um, now, let's go to the bullpen. Let's ask what the league-wide splits were based on handedness for, for relief pitchers. So, right-handed pitchers had a 4.27 ERA out of the bullpen. What would you guess lefties out of the bullpen had as an ERA last year? I'm going to go with my same hypothesis. Basically, you're a little bit more matchup dependent, so I'll take off. Point two, so four point oh seven, something like that. They were even better than that. Lefties had a three point eight nine ERA out of the bullpen last oh, year. Oh dang! Okay. So it is quite a big difference. This is a huge data set that we're talking about now. The yeah, entire sure. leagues. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and if we want to get like even more, like this is why you need lefties. Um, let's now look at left-handed hitters against handedness. In inning six or later, okay, so that's sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth inning or extra innings. Lefty hitters against right-handers had an ERA of four point three five, or I guess what you should say is the right-handed pitchers had an ERA against lefty batters of four point three five in innings six or later. Um, based on a four point three five ERA that righties had against left-handed hitters in inning six plus. What would you guess lefties had? I'm sorry, you cut it. So four point what was the number? Four point three five ERA. That's what righty Z5. pitchers had against left-handed hitters in inning six or later. So based off of that, inning six, seven, yeah. eight, nine, extra innings. How are left-handed pitchers doing against lefty hitters? My instinct would say like three eight, but now it sounds like you're saying it's even better than that. So I'll go a little bit more three six. It's just even slightly better than that. 3.55 ERA. So yeah. almost a whole yeah. point eight. So it's point eight of a run. And, it, you know, an eighth, not an eighth of a run. What's the right word? Uh, you know, point eight of a run. Four fifths of a run 
<laughs> Almost Torfus. a whole run is what I'm trying to say. Is that, <laughs> is that lefties, lefties are better against righties? Or sorry, fuck, I'm sorry. This is a little bit get a little in the weeds. Left-handed <laughs> pitchers are 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 almost a whole run better against left-handed hitters in late innings than yeah. right-handed pitchers. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, so that's huge. That's massive. Like, and so uh, just looking at that data from a thirty thousand foot point of view, like having a lefty starter on average is not better than having a righty starter. Having a lefty reliever on average is way better than having a righty reliever. Okay. In, in, in any given situation, um, for matchups, especially, yeah. Yes. I mean, it, if, I mean, a lot of bullpens to me is just like how you match up against the best hitters in a lineup. And if you have a left handed pitching ace and you can line them up against whoever the best left handed pitchers in a lineup, it's a huge advantage, right? Yes. It's a massive, massive advantage. And, um, now, given all of this data, lefties, obviously, there aren't as many lefties, so they're not throwing as often as, as, as right-handed pitchers. Um, basically, for every three hitters that right-handers face, left-handers hit one hitter. The exact number is 2.94, but just for the sake of this giant argument that we're going to make right now, let's just be generous and sure. let's say it's three. It's uh, For every three innings that a right-hander throws, uh, a left-hander has to throw one inning. So if you're looking at a 162-game season, and you're saying we need to prepare for four innings of relief every game. Like, I think that's a pretty fair, uh, you know, say sure. starters go five, you know, simplistic argument. That means that you need uh, 162 innings from lefties in your bullpen. Okay. Right now, the Padres, in terms of left handed pitching in 2024, the right hand, the, 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 the Padres only have Yuki Matsui, Tom Cosgrove, Adrian Morahone. Those are your lefty options for the Padres right now. Based on uh, Fangraph's depth charts projections, um, they are going to cover 172 innings. I think that's incredibly generous. <laughs> I think yeah, that is <laughs> I, to the point where I'm almost willing to just throw them away entirely. Um, I think that because uh, it has more home throwing 52 innings, he's not throwing. <laughs> okay, innings. Yeah. I will take the under on that to the bank. <laughs> Um, I'm going to throw out a different number. 30 innings. Do you think Adrian Morhone throws 30 innings this year? <laughs> so Morhone has had five seasons as a Padre and he's thrown a total of 75 innings. Yeah. So like, <laughs> do you think Adrian Morhone's going to throw 30 innings this year? Uh, I will say that we will force him into 35, and then he'll get hurt. That's what I would Okay. Say. So, yes, I'll go over. Okay. Point taken. He gets th he's 35, and he gets hurt. Well, now you have to have Matsui and Cosgrove covering all of those innings that, that Morahone can't cover. So, like, let's say that, you know, Morahone only throws 30 innings. Like, then you need uh, Matsui and Cosgrove to each throw at least 65 innings to cover the difference, if not more. And that's assuming there's that no they way. stay healthy. There's, yeah, no there's no way. way. There's <laughs> no way. And I just want to say, okay, I, I, I would say the not so disaster disaster case. I think this is incredibly plausible is that those three pitchers give you a hundred innings. Okay. I think that's, yeah, I, I would think take that's, it. I would take it right now. I think that's I very buy. within reason. But but let's just take that. Let's just say 100 innings from those guys. Sure. That means that you need, uh, that, that there's a gap of essentially 60 to 70 innings that you need to cover that are, are, that are going to be pitched by right-handers that would have been pitched by left-handers. And just in an average situation, that's a difference of about four runs that you would expect based on our projections. That's half of a win essentially right there. Now, that's not taking into account like, the leverage, the matchups, we, we just laid out how much sure. more effective lefty relievers are against left-handed hitters, given the right context. And I'm really terrified about the prospect <laughs> of the Dodgers coming to town and we've got Freddie Freeman, you know, hitting or uh, Shohei Otani. And it's like, oh no, we need to, we need to throw in Usuk Go because like Adrian Morahone is on the 60-day IL, something that's never happened before. Uh, like, so... I, this is like, I would say for me, this is my <laughs> probably number one concern point for the for for the for the Padres. 
anything to do with Padres pitching in general, more than the like starting pitcher situation, which like will get figured out. Like we're going to trade for someone. We're going to sign someone. If they're all five righties, as I've just said, I don't really give a shit. But if they don't get more lefty arms, we are screwed. Like we are truly, truly screwed because kind of like what we were talking about with the it, it it's it's not dissimilar from like the uh third time through the order thing i think third time through the order is a much bigger gap but that's actually something that you can choose to change like if they don't have enough yeah, lefty yeah, arms yeah. there they, there's nothing just, they can you do yeah. you you know what i mean like it's like it's just the same thing like in the 2020 playoffs where it's like, well, we got to start Craig Stammen in game three of the decisive <laughs> playoff game because we're out and of guys. And win, by the way. And win, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, you're like, how dare you, Rafi? How dare you, yeah. how dare you just merge? But, it's but, one of the best wins in Padres history, by the way. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a fun game to watch. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I would just say, I, I don't, you know, I, we could go t- talk about this until the cows come home, but like, like, I, I really don't think it has to get that much more in depth than that. Like, I think if we get 100 yeah, innings yeah. from our three lefties, like, that's great. And that's already costing us half of a win right there on average, but probably worse because we're not talking about leverage and, you know, certain situations, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, it, it kind of like what you were talking about with, uh, you know, it's two and a half wins if we are playing smarter third time through the order. Like, if you add like a lack of lefty to there that's just three wins like that that we just like you know of whole cloth that we are just losing because of yeah. poor management and poor roster construction like that's a lot that's that's like a big deal so um i don't know i b- before i before we start to, to kind of move this towards the end uh like do you have any feelings about that is that are these numbers like <laughs> what you were expecting not what you were expecting no, I mean that's that's good information. I I just like that in general. I I also do like the like growing discrepancy between us and the Dodgers where wherein we're thinking like you know what we need against one of the best hitters in the world, Shohei Tani, and one of the other best hitters in the world, Freddie Freeman is more Adrian Morion innings. And yeah. It's like a guy it's like like a guy who's pitched like 75 innings of a 5 ERA or whatever. <laughs> yeah it's like yeah, yeah literally a 5.28 era for 75 innings the most innings he's ever had at the major league level is 34 and we're like that's what we need against otani and freddie freeman it's just <laughs> it's just this, yeah. this little sad little <laughs> difference from like last year when we were like you know what we just might have them this year we're we don't have them we don't have them. i i, I love <laughs> the argument from the organization like eric rubner was out if you had woken up three years ago and you had seen what our payroll commitments are like you would believe it it's like bro if i had woken up between now and october and i saw what we're working with and what the dodgers are working with like i'd be having like nom flashbacks right now or i am i guess I, what i'm saying is like it's 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 yeah i point taken like things are we're in a much different place than we were four months ago um we're a third or fourth place organization now and before we were a third or fourth place organization (laughs) we we had second place upside yeah (laughs) where we were second place (laughs) yeah exactly um okay so we're spending more money inefficiently that's what i want you all to know Exactly. Um, so let's say now that we've just taken that big dump on our team that we do get to the playoffs. <laughs> how does that change things, John? Uh, I'm going to do this really quick because it's been too long since we left in our P- uh, par. So like we're running long on the hours, but I'm just going to say that like it's, I made an argument very upfront that I think that we're going full Preller. I think that that's basically what the Schilt hiring is. And if you remember for example, in 2020, when we were likely to make the playoffs, we had Garrett Richards and we sent him into the relief core despite not having very many starting pitchers available at the time because what we were trying to do, he very like clearly showed it, was that he was trying to work towards bullpen games in the playoffs. He wanted Clevenger to go. Lamette to go in one order or the other, and then he wanted every other game to probably be some version of a bullpen game. Maybe Paddock goes one time through the order. Probably Zach Davies, he hoped, would not pitch at all. He probably wanted Garrett Richards with his high spin rates to throw like after Paddock or whoever else was pitching and just, you know, get to the middle innings. And 
he created rosters that I think simulated what he had wanted in the past. I think the Seth Lugo signing, the love of Nick Martinez, was very like illustrative of what he had wanted to do in the past, which is have a few good starters and then have dudes who can be basically, you know, starting pitchers during the regular season, give you X amount of innings, hopefully 100 plus, but really convert into a bullpen type role one time through the order is probably what he was like thinking of maybe one and a half times through an order in his mind is how he was like managing while he was playing video games or whatever Jay Tingler was doing. And I think that we are doing a similar version this year wherein he wants it. We have, we, we need basically Musgrove and Darvish to be successful at least by playoff time. Maybe they'll get hurt, you know, but before that and be successful more towards September, whatever, line them up for the playoffs. If we are a playoff team and hope that maybe Michael King is also a third person who can like start a game and go at least two times through an order in the playoffs. But everybody else, Brito, Vasquez, all of the relievers that I mentioned as like high leverage arms are who he wants to be pitching in any possible playoff game. And to be honest, I have nothing to argue against that. I think that that makes complete sense. If you're going to build a team and you don't know whether they're going to make it to the playoffs, but you're trying to build up a certain amount of innings, it does make sense to leverage your arms towards being folks that can convert into a higher leverage, at least one time through the order type situation should the playoffs come. So I have no arguments against that. I just think that that's, he's kind of telegraphed that that's what he's trying to do in terms of building the team. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Um, all right. Well, we have a solution, John. We do, have, <laughs> do, we? do it. We do have <laughs> one way to fix it. And I know you've talked about it in the past. I just talked about it on Padres hot tub this past week. Um, and I would go so far as to say, like, if this like wild card strategy were implemented successfully there's a lot of variables like i i would say it could be like a difference between us making the playoffs or not i would like honestly go that far because of the downstream effects of like what it means in terms of like our bullpen usage and like you know how often we're throwing out like guys in certain leverage situations everything like that so uh it would have to be successful which is a big if but john what yeah, what, what is sure. the strategy that we are talking about all right, Rafi and I are founding members of the founding culture. Card carrying members. We were there. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, we're like, what is this? Like a year and a half of us just like yeah. everybody. This is the plan. And there's a good reason for it. So, but also what's funny is that like, there's been this weird turn against us. where like, we are founding members of the Waldron Cauldron. And like, suddenly everybody's like, oh, you know what Waldron is? It's probably a four star. We're all like, whoa that's not what we said like yeah. we were like the most ambitious of them all and even we were like that's that's not what we meant yeah. at all that's way too way too ambitious of a use of matt waldron what what we were saying originally you know one and a half years ago was that a knuckleballer is currently a advantage in terms of a roster spot especially if used in an opening scenario and this is like, this, using Matt Waldron in the manner that I'm saying that we should probably use Matt Waldron feels very much like, like one of those like card, like deck building games. Like if you ever played Dominion or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Or, or uh, where you're like trying to like use something to then make the other thing better. But that's how I envision using Waldron. And also some very smart executives, including Andrew Freeman and also Zaidi, have said that they also would want this to be able to use, like, use an opener as a knuckleballer, you know, for reasons that I will explicitly state. And those are that a knuckleballer, one, you can use them very often, right? And also that, two, the pitcher who comes in after a knuckleballer has a huge advantage because the, the pitcher before them was just a knuckleballer. So, one... You can use a knuckleballer as an opener, and anybody who's scouting for that game either has to choose between two terrible options. Those two terrible options are, hey, we should have everybody prep for a knuckleball, even though they're only going to face them one time, 
which is going to like make you way off for anybody who follows them or hey we're not going to have you prep for a knuckleballer at all and therefore the knuckleballer is going to be successful and anybody else who follows is going to have you know fewer than expected runs early you know early on and especially with our team like right now there's no better time than to use Matt Waldron as an opener in my perspective and the reason why is because the folks for whom we would use Matt Waldron as an opener are explicitly guys who have high velo fastballs whose shape is really the problem. You know, Vasquez and Brito are, and Pedro Avila, not all of them have velo. They all can throw like 94 plus, 94, 95, 96, 97, Brito up to 98, but none of their shapes are good. So dudes that can throw hard, but the shapes of their fastball don't have a lot of ride. Who exactly would you want them to follow? It would be exactly a knuckleballer. Somebody who has you like a little bit off in terms of timing, but the guy that throws next is throwing at such a high velo that you might be able to buy one strike because even buying one strike is going to give you a huge advantage going forward. So the same thing as the middle innings problem, this is the middle innings problem solved as an opener, right? It's, it's somebody who takes an inning or two on average, going through a lineup one time is going to be about like two innings, you know, about if he has like 1.5 whip, something like that. And so getting those two innings up front and then having Brito pitch with a tiny bit of advantage of the, you know, batter either being thrown off because they prepped for a knuckleball or being like not thrown off, but also having just seen a knuckleball, maybe buying you one strike is going to be like this little, you know, card playing advantage, you know, you, whatever's your preface card that makes the next card a little bit stronger and makes it so that Brito can only only has to pitch four innings in order to get to the seventh, eighth, ninth, nine guys. And so there's there's not like a scenario that I could possibly think of in which to use Waldron better than the current scenario in which we have. Um, I just want to point out that the, this article that we're referencing uh, that, that quotes like Andrew Friedman and Farhan Zaidi is, is a Bill Shaken article for the LA Times that came out in 2021. And Andrew Friedman talks about when they were with the, uh, him and Zaidi were with the Rays, they tried to do a knuckleball camp where they like signed guys <laughs> to, 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 to like learn how to throw knuckleball. And it was unsuccessful. Like the Rays, the Andrew Friedman like Rays could not teach guys how to throw knuckleballs like w- with the explicit purpose of them doing it. And I bring that up because we have a guy that can do it. Like, that's crazy that we have so a guy who can throw knuckleballs at the major league level and is like, I mean, doesn't I think have a big enough sample size to say that like it's successful, but it certainly has a chance to be successful. And uh, his ex was you know, 236 on it and he had a 318 spin rate. Like th- if you have a 318 spin rate, it's knuckling. It's knuckling. Like he, clearly yeah. it's knuckling. And yeah. the ex Wobo was great. The Wobo was great. Everything was great. He just, he, I mean, he only threw it 27% of the time, so you got to ramp up that usage. And also, I'm very willing to bail on this plan as soon as it doesn't work. Yes. But. 100%. <laughs> like, but, but we're in, it, guess what? If it doesn't work, we're in the exact position that we are in now. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, all, all, all that happens is that, like, we tried something cool that, like, really smart baseball people have wanted to do, and it didn't work, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Like that's fine. And he has he has to beat like a 731 ERA to be worth more than like Lugo and Waka were in the middle innings, you know? Yeah. And he's already proven that he can be better than that, right? So like can his knuckleball be better than a 5 ERA? That's basically the premise of this argument. Like Yeah. And again, it's I, like I think Go ahead, sorry. I just think that it will be. I think that if he threw that 75% of the time, that people would not put up a higher than 5 ERA on it. Uh, assuming that we're not going to sign anyone else, which I think we will sign or trade for, for some other starter at some point. But let's just say what it is. We know, based on John's research, that Darvish and Musgrove can go third time through the order. But we don't know what the deal is with King, Brito, and Vasquez. And I would go so far as to say, I can almost guarantee you they will not be just as good third time through the order. They just don't seem like the type of pitchers that would be. So if yeah. you take waldron and stick them as an op- stick him as an opener on those three guys starts like have him go one time through the order just throwing 80 percent knuckleballs and then you're limiting 
while um king brito and vasquez to only going twice through the order like then you're already into the like seventh inning you know what i mean and then, yeah. then it's like then you bring out your your stud relievers and then like okay all of a sudden like we have a fighting chance instead of like having to bring in like the ghost of alec jacob or i don't even know if he's gonna pitch this year you know like yeah. with these whatever injured and everything so, whoever whoever the honeywell is of this year or whatever yes you know, like that exactly guy. exactly um, who's going to be coming in in a in a higher leverage situation than you know uh, than Waldron would be at the beginning of the game when you know it's definition of of average leverage. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, this was very fun, John. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy talking about the Padres in this light. Um, any uh, parting shots before we uh, wrap this thing up? It's that in order to be successful. Going forward with a slightly worse team, the only thing that I can think is that we have to be slightly smarter. So anybody out there, when we're doing experiments, in order to try to be slightly smarter, have an open mind. Because I want there to be open minds when we try to do things. Like if, if Nabil Chrismat or, you know, whatever Zard, this year's version of Nabil Chrismat, Alec Jacob, comes in in the, you know, fifth inning and Johnny Brito doesn't get his win. It was a good experiment. It was worth the try. Um, if our success is dependent on people in 2024 having open minds, we're fucked. Um, <laughs> so so uh, on that note, uh, this has been another episode of Positive Up Replacement. Uh, we're here on the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. We hope you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, you've been looking at us at our wedding rings, at videos of Waka and Luga getting shelled. Uh, subscribe, <laughs> of course. Uh, and, uh, we don't know when we're going to do this again. Uh, hopefully it's sooner rather than later. Uh, but it's the off season and you don't want us like, like just trying to come up with ridiculous, nothing to talk (laughs) about. Uh, and that's also not what we want to do. Uh, so, uh, we will come at you soon. Uh, for John Percota, I'm Rafi Cantor and see you next time.